see that many of you are wisely taking a prolonged coffee. That's a good idea. Um, I have a strong sense of being among friends. Many of you I have met at various times. The most important thing is if I drift away and you can't hear, is it okay now? Yes. It is. Because I don't like holding these things. So, um, I can see Daniel back there. David, oh, Daniel, David, I'm okay, getting so many of you mixed up now. Raise your hand if you can't hear me. What we've been talking about today, that is if you still wish to hear, of course. I've already been set up in many ways, and the next session after mine too will be going the same way. Like many of you, you go to medical school, uh, you don't know it, I didn't know it, but within a few weeks I was turned into a reductionist. Uh, it wasn't long before I referred to patients by their diseases and not by their names, and so it goes on. Uh, you know the process. Um, it has a long history. It goes back to at least the 14th century. It's even present in church on Sunday morning. It's called reductionism. It made modern science possible by that reduction. Uh, that's what the experimental method is. You reduce things, and if the approximation is worthwhile, you get some good outcomes. Newton spent a long while on the mathematics of mass points, which don't exist, but were essential to the thinking yeah. So, the power of what came out of that change with the advent of the universities in the 12th century was huge. And at the same time, the Catholic Church was in trouble uh, in that its hierarchy was more corrupt by the year in many respects, particularly around the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, I'm on the side of thinking that why did God allow Constantine to give the church money because money corrupts? We're better off than we're poor. I can say that as uh, being somewhat in charge of a college which has never had a viable business plan for the last 20 years. Uh, but we have survived. It's good to be that way in some respects, but particularly the next speaker uh, puts it more on the line than I do, and you might think of him as you're listening to his talk. And he'll crucify me for saying this, but he has no pension and he's giving his life to treat, teaching a few children who become adults under his care, much more than under mine, and turning them into people who will make a difference in the world. Um, we owe it to him to look after him in due course as well as we can, but God is in charge ultimately, but he's putting it to the, the test in a very real way, which I've, I have not done. But what I have done has made a huge impact on my life in teaching me that at the end of the day, the only question that matters is I will be done. There really is only one prayer at the end. When you put it all together, it's I will be done. I didn't take any notice of that until, oh, sadly, well into my 40s. Uh, I was ambitious, God had made me reasonably smart. Uh, that means I could have a pleasant life working four days a week as a professor and going to the 17th century together without the dean's permission. Um, that was a lovely way to live. As long as I, I knew nothing would happen to me, as long as I was publishing and I had grants, it didn't matter if the students wrote the worst lecture I'd ever heard on my report, it didn't matter, nothing would happen. And it did. Uh, fortunately, I had some skills in teaching that came naturally, so I didn't put it that way. But then students got on my case, and what we're talking about this morning is one of the first things that happened. Some Christian students had heard me give a very cynical lecture in Oroba, which is it's perfectly true, that the vast majority, particularly of evangelical Christians, whom I know best, when they go to university, the probability of them coming out the other end with a faith intact is remarkably low, right? Somewhere over the order of 20%. There's a gap in our churches. 10 or 15 years. You come back in the end. It's good time I'm not using PowerPoint, isn't it? Um, we come back in the end because the life questions, why am I here, where do I come from, where am I going, have power and they get to our soul over time. Uh, I didn't get to mine for a long while. I never had the faith to deny what I had been brought up in. I never disbelieved the story. You need a lot of faith to be an atheist. If you think about it. You have to believe there is no God. It's not possible to prove that it's true. 
and then you're responsible for everything, including the climate. You know, that's why <laughs> they get into things they're not capable of handling because they don't believe there's somebody who does know what he's doing. We're in the other camp. So, what happened was I began to see when I had to take that to a living in Canada, whereas previously I lived just on research, that the students were actually empty in many ways. They hadn't discussed the big questions. And they were totally vulnerable to my most hated faculty, which is the Faculty of Education. Medical education is now going the same route 20 years behind everybody else because we're very conservative. We're slow, but we then proceed to make the same mistakes. If I had 20 minutes and I could pass one law that would change the whole of North America, it would be to abolish the faculty of education. Um, because they, in my view, have destroyed learning. You see, they think, because they belong to the modern university, that post-enlightenment, better post-endarkenment rationality <laughs> explains everything. And it doesn't. Uh, the person who fixed this problem for me was Wendell Berry. How many Wendell Berry readers do I have? A few, and there ought to be a lot more. Those of you who are male and need to get in your wife's good books, buy Hannah Coulter and give it to her. Um, it takes a great writer to write a, a compelling novel about a good person, and that's what he's done in Hannah Coulter. Uh, if it's the other way around, buy Life is a Miracle and give it to your husband. I might make him think. But in his first Port William novel, he's written the imagined social history of a, an American community in Kentucky over the whole of the last century. And in the first novel, which is a love story between a great big gawky farmer called Ptolemy and the village school teacher, Miss Minnie, who's the exact opposite in every way, with her one room schoolroom. And to give you a sense of how good a writer he is, he can give you a picture of both those characters in a couple of sentences. He says of Ptolemy that Ptolemy was a big man whose clothes looked as though they had been taken by surprise 20 minutes after he put them on. Uh, you've got the picture immediately, haven't you? You all know guys like that. Uh, neat and tidy when they leave, but not for long. Miss Minnie was the exact opposite, but he doesn't describe her in that way. He says, Miss Minnie went to teacher's college where she learned many cunning techniques which she never subsequently used because Miss Minnie loved children and she loved books and she taught by merely introducing the one to the other. What Wendell Berry has done there is nailed the faculty of education because great teachers are not made by the university, they're made by God and it requires two gifts which the university cannot give, the love of learning and the love of the pupil. Two loves. Wendell Berry also solved one big problem for me in 1 Timothy 3 about the governance of the church. Because if you look at that list, they're all character traits. There's nothing about skill. It's character that matters for leadership. You hire skill. But character must rule. The church has forgotten that, of course. But Paul puts this, he says to Paul, you must appoint as elders people who are apt to teach. And I thought, well, that's a skill for years. And now, of course, it's not. It's a gift. It's a gift that God had given me, and I refuse to recognize it as a gift for years. I'm not looking forward to giving an account of that neglect. I was well brought up, so I knew that if you had skills, you had duties. The only way to avoid the duty is to pretend you don't have the skill. And I did that for years. Eventually it was brought to an end, rather ironically, by an Asian professor. Uh, I was very flippant with undergraduate lectures. And um, one year, for some quite extraordinary reason, they gave me a teaching award. And this professor came up to me and said, You've got a teaching award. Tell me, how long do you actually spend preparing undergraduate lectures? And I rather flippantly said, well, 20 minutes is a bit excessive, isn't it? <laughs> and he said, you're not actually joking, are you? And I said, not for undergraduate lectures, no. 
And he said, that's so unfair. I spend hours and they, they tell me I'm an awful teacher. But of course, especially in the modern world, if you all you do is transmit information, well, Apple is better at that than you are. <laughs> if you can't make a student see something in a different way, you shouldn't be teaching. They've got to go away at least with one or two things that will make a difference to their lives. Hopefully, I'm going to do that for you in the next little while. Hopefully, I've already done it to make you <coughs> critical of the things that come out of the Faculty of Education. And at the back, God always orchestrates these things, but it was one thing after another in the early 80s just hammering me until I gave in. Um, but one of the key ones was, in fact, our Faculty of Education, who sent a missive around the university saying that teaching should be from a morally neutral position. Steam was rising when I read it. I was so angry. Uh, I sat down at my computer and I wrote a paper in the next three hours. Uh, it was called The Myth of Moral Neutrality, and I felt better when I finished it. Uh, I didn't even put it through a spell check. I sent it to a friend who was an Irishman, and that was dangerous, uh, who ran the Canadian equivalent of CMDA, CMDS. And he published it without my permission. Uh, I said, Bob, it hasn't even gone through a spell check. It was a spell, spelling mistake in the first line, but nobody seemed to care. Uh, he said it had passion, the guys will like it. Now in Canada, in the summer, we don't work because good weather is such a short time. Uh, everybody goes off to their cottage and we have a lake per person, roughly, you know. <laughs> when Minnesota advertised as uh, land of a thousand lakes, Saskatchewan responded by land of a hundred thousand lakes and no traffic jams. Um, so, it, the cottage is where people go for a lot of the time. And I guess it rains occasionally, and if you're like me, you have to read something. And I think my talk came somewhere next to the cereal box in desperation. Uh, but they read it. And being Christian, they photocopied freely and sent it around the world. <laughs> uh, that changed my life. And of course, moral neutrality is just pure nonsense. It's a denial of the fundamental law of lab, lab logic, the law of non-contradiction. You have just made an absolute statement, to prove that absolute statements don't exist, and you've presumed moral neutrality, and you only have to ask, why should I be morally neutral? They can't answer the question without proposing some form of morality. It's ridiculous. It, it would do well in the mouth of the Red Queen or something like that. I, I was furious, really furious. Um, but then Americans get in the act, and you're different from Canadians in this, in that you like to do things. If I recommend books to an American audience, you go and get them, read them, and then write to me and say it wasn't worth reading, or it was worth reading, and tell me another one. Canadians say, oh, that'd be a good book to read. They don't buy it, they go and buy a bottle of beer and go and watch hockey. And, uh, <laughs> we won't let you starve in Canada, so if you don't want to work and you have a low level of living, you're fine. We have communities that haven't worked for two or three generations, you know. Um, and they are communities, that's a good bit of it. They all live the same place on welfare, like Alabama does here, as far as I can say. Um, but that's our world. But moral neutrality is not a position that exists. People want it because they want peace. And we have got to learn to deal with this problem by going back to the foundations of the society. Now, society can only exist, really, if it has some moral foundations. If you don't believe me, try living for a day without using the subjunctive tense. No oughts, no shoulds, no musts. You can't do it. You certainly can't run a family without it, can you? <laughs> and yet, that's what they're proposing to us, that we should do that. As though physical facts will tell us what to do. They don't. Imagine this gentleman in the red the jersey at the front. He looks a cheerful guy, so I can use him as my victim. <laughs> imagine that he's got cancer. And imagine that last week in my laboratory, I invented a cure for his cancer. Or try to give it to him. Now, you know I'm out to get you, but what's the nice Christian response? Yeah. Yes, yeah, he hasn't got many friends. He's got work to do at lunch time. <laughs> uh, but, Yes, but what if I'm a really well thought out Darwinian? And he's a rich man, and when he dies, I inherit his estate. Now what ought I to do with my so far unknown cure? 
I should keep it, shouldn't I? Because it's going to take time to get the money coming back from the cure, so I might as well take his estate as a starter. And the best arguments against Darwin are the moral ones. Read David Stowe's Darwinian fairy tales if you want it laid out for you. And the great thing about David Stowe is that he's an atheist, or was. He committed suicide when he found he got cancer. Australia's best analytical philosopher of the last 25 years. Uh, a lovely summer read. Uh, he'll have you laughing and he'll have you thinking. He hates Darwinianism with a passion because it is irrational. He doesn't care. It, evolution certainly occurs at a micro level, so no question about that. Anybody who denies that is simply ignorant. But as an overall ex explanation of human beings, it's not acceptable. He will not work. And he knows why. There are no orbs in the Darwinian world. And we're the only creature that has that capacity for moral reflection. No other creature does. The best way to get at it, and I had this happen to me as a gift in Harvard of all places, um, talking actually about abortion and the consequences of abortion. And one of the things is the animal rights movement, actually. And uh, I was reaching this point and having a debate with myself. I was in Harvard and it wasn't, they weren't getting too upset. I didn't need to make it worse for myself by pushing buttons, but I couldn't resist. Uh, because into my head popped one of Harvard's favorite sons, Robert Frost. And he saw what we're dealing with coming a long while ago. A dozen lines from it came into my head. I live on a farm, as he did, and hornets are part of the farm every year. Uh, they're interesting insects. He was fascinated by them. And the poem comes out of the fact that he was watching this particular year, went a bit too close, got stung, but still went back and watched. So the first part of the poem describes that. And then he watches the hornet one day, and he was attacking a nail which is a bit stupid. Uh, and it took three goes to find out that it was a nail, that it wasn't food. And then he realized he'd been anthropomorphizing the insect. And so he wrote this. He said, won't this instinct matter bear revision? Won't almost any theory bear revision? To err is human, not to animal. Or so we take, pay the compliment that really takes away instead of gives. Our humor, conscientiousness, and worship went long since to the dogs under the table and served us right for having instituted downward comparisons. As long on earth as our comparisons were stably upwards, with gods and angels we were men at least. But once our comparisons were yielded downwards into the mud and even dust, it was dissolution upon dissolution. We were lost piecemeal to the animals like people thrown out to delay the walls. Only our fallibility was left us, and this day's work makes even that seem doubtful. It actually had a very stunning effect on the Harvard audience, but uh, he's made the point, hasn't he? We are not just animals. We are different from any other animal, and we need to talk about that. They want us to practice medicine as though we are just another animal. Multiple numbers of any class now have difficulty <laughs> in distinguishing between the rights of animals and the rights of human beings now. Any rights at all exist only by the courtesy of God. Uh, what he's written on our hearts and what we've been allowed to think when we think about it. So we've got to go back a lot further. History matters, which is why we started Augustine College. Because you, by and large, do not know who you are. You are the product of Hebrew and Greek thought modified by the church, and you don't know the main actors. That's bad news. You don't know which were the events that made the, diff the difference. 1277 probably wouldn't mean anything to you, and it should. And those are the things that matter. So hopefully when they leave us, they have some heroes they didn't have before. How many of you know who John Ray is, for instance? There's no one in your audience. And John Ray is the father of botany and an amazing Christian man. Just Google John Ray, or we'll go to jri.org afterwards, and read the story of this amazing 17th century. Once we teach these stories, our young people become much more capable of dealing with their professors than they did before. And in addition, a good thing new comes up next, does the formal classical logic so that they can take a professor down. I do it in my own cavalier fashion, but that works too. Uh, they do take professors down. One of them, for instance, a few years ago in Michigan, her first term in medical school, the guy teaching embryology comes along and 
He's showing the pictures of the human embryo. And saying, Look how small and trivial it is. Why do these pro-lifers make so much fuss to people who don't want it at this particular point? And he waxes his eloquent in a pro-choice soliloquy. Cassie put up a hand. It's his courage, isn't it? In first year, it doesn't happen very often. He looked at her and said, young woman, do you have a problem? And she said, yes, sir, what you have just done is an ad hominem attack on pro-life people. I think that's disgraceful in a professor, and you should apologize. <laughs> he was so stunned, he didn't know what to say. He said, maybe I was a trifle excessive, and he moved on. But the result of it was, at the end of that session, 40 students came up to Cassie and said, well done. And who were they? Evangelicals and Orthodox Catholic. We don't have many Orthodox of the big old variety. You count them, you know, one every 10 years or so. But the, the real uh, numbers in the class formed a pro-life group on the spot. Uh, I was there about six weeks later to give a lunchtime lecture, and half the class followed me out into the courtyard, didn't go to afternoon classes. We had a tutorial. That's our world, and it's exciting. We can have fun because we have an understanding of the world that can that works. This doesn't. It's falling apart at the seams, isn't it? You can see that. You cannot use rationality in the post-enlightenment sense. I will not call it enlightenment, uh, and get to what they want. They want to keep things that make society working, and they're not doing it. And they can't. And we have to show them why. So that's where Hippocrates came in for me, because uh, I didn't used to go to graduation. I considered it a total waste of time. Uh, but the students had bullied me into starting Bible study, which I said I'd do for four weeks, and I ended up doing for 10 years. Uh, then their parents wanted to meet me, so I had to start going to graduation. <laughs> and the first time I went, on the agenda was the Hippocratic Oath. I was late, so I didn't have a program, and I listened, I said, that's not the Hippocratic Oath. And when I got a copy, of course, it's been got at. Students look at it, you know, two weeks before graduation, and say, oh, I don't like that, and they change it. That's arrogance of the first order. Something that informed medicine for uh, 2,000 years ought to be taken with more respect than that. So I got a copy, and I was bored. And here's four things I want you to Possibly right now, uh, unless you want to go and dig them out of Donna's 150 pages of bump, you know. Uh, only Donna would do that. I mean, if you want more information, it's possible to get on the slide, ask it to show you how it's done. Uh, uh, but, uh, wonderful, if you want to know the answer to anything, just call it. But, I want you to think of four key ideas that you need to incorporate in your conversation if we're going to win this battle. The first thing is that the Hippocratic Oath opens with the invocation of transcendence. Transcendence is important to our lives. And I'm very glad that God gave these insights to a polytheistic pagan because it means I can talk about it in a secular setting and nobody can bring up anti-Christian rhetoric as an answer to what I'm saying. Because he does it for us. So take that gift and use it. He says, I bow by Apollo, my dear Panacea, and Asclepius, and all the gods and goddesses. Now, you wouldn't take that out, because you're naive. Uh, Christians did for centuries, because they weren't naive. I mean, they were, they had a better cultural tradition when they took it in its original form to honor the man and men who wrote it. Uh, of course, it only had any validity in the sense that you were saying it to your God as well. What's the point of asking a Darwinian to swear on the Bible? It's ridiculous. What I would say as a judge is, is there any way we can find out when you're going to tell us the truth? The answer is no. It makes life difficult. The biggest problem for the young people in this class is who are you going to trust during your lifetime? If I said to you, those, I don't know, how many of you got to a Stone Medical School? Any here? A few. If I said to you that within six weeks of getting to medical school, you decided there were some people in your class to whom you would never trust the care of a dog of yours, wouldn't you say? I can see the nods, the smiles. It's the same everywhere. Now, I used to say it's 20% of the class, but in the last year, one of our graduates from Augustine sent me a note from a very well-known medical school a little in this province, this state, rather, uh, saying, you have to change your numbers. I don't trust 
50% of my class. <laughs> and the ones I do trust are all at the bottom of the class because everybody else is involved in a very sophisticated cheating cartel. <laughs> One of your well-known medicals. Do you want them as your doctor? Because that's their way of life. They're not immoral, they're amoral. We're in trouble. What are the foundations? Well, transcendence is necessary. I mean, rationally, do you trust your doctor more or less if he believes in judgment after death? It's not an issue of the religion, it's an issue of rationality. Secondly, these wonderful guys recognize that medicine is intrinsically not a scientific or technical activity, but a moral one. Because no patient, as has been pointed out this morning, has to take your advice, do they? So what you do, actually, is you help patients to decide what they ought to do. The next session will point out how difficult that is, but at one level, you can understand that. You can't get from physical facts to moral injunctions. I've just demonstrated that with the gentleman in the front row. So what moral creed you have matters. I think we should all start putting an H in brackets on our degree list, on our shingle. People will ask what it means, and you say it means I won't kill you. <laughs> that creates a conversation. Sally will be outside with pins that simply have Hippocrates on them, and when someone asks what it is, say, it means I won't kill you, and you have a conversation. Uh, we need you to give us a few bucks, because they do cost money to uh, give to medical students, and you've got money, so just make a donation. <laughs> It's worth doing. The first time I went into the bank with mine and I said that to the teller, went back and two other tellers joined the conversation. We had a teaching session for about five minutes. So, understand that. The next thing he understood was that we need to make the key commitment of our morality the notion that we will not kill for the good of patients as a whole because some patients at least need to know that a doctor will not kill them. We need to make, as we should have made abortion, a killing an entirely separate activity. It has no place in medicine historically. Uh, yes, a secular society obviously has a right, except they can't derive their rights, but they think they have a right anyway, to be killed. And that's where their Darwinian world will lead them. Uh, but it shouldn't be in medicine. I mean, you can train somebody to kill somebody in 10 minutes, can't you? If they've got a good hand-eye and you can teach them to get something in a vein and tell them what to put there, it's done. But you don't need to go to medical school for 10 years. And if we bring it into medicine, it will destroy medicine. If they won't accept that, we have a case to be made, not on religious grounds, but on grounds of democracy and justice. Because still 70% of people in North America think that faith matters, and it's the Christian faith that matters. We may be multicultural to a degree, but not for very long. Very shortly, most uh, religions will be integrated into North America. Uh, the Muslims will be the most difficult to integrate, but even they will, will, it will happen over time. I've been in Albania, where there are multiple mosques that the Saudis have, all, have uh, built, and nobody ever goes there. That's the way it is. It's a culture, not a religion in many respects. So we need to think about this and how we're going to talk about it. And the final one is our right to conscience. Hippocrates put it like this, he said, I will guard my life and heart in purity. That is conscience rights. And I am going to say two things about conscience, because other people have said, and everything will say some more, but two points that I make all the while, and you can teach, particularly your residents and students in medical school. All the younger generation in medicine are going to be asked to do things which are immoral from their perspective. How are they to respond? Don't say no. Especially when you're a student, because you have a way out. You say, before I obey you, may I ask you a question? No university teacher or professional teacher can refuse to answer a question. And the question is, do you wish you and your family to be cared for by a doctor with or without moral integrity? Gotcha. There is no one, not even a man, and Hillary, who want a doctor without moral integrity to care for them. And yet they want to trash the moral integrity of doctors who represent 70% of the population and allow 30% to
to impose, and I love saying this to them, impose their recent ideas which are not well worked out on the rest of us. And you've got to talk about this every day. Yeah, my wife gets mad with me. Most people who sit next to me on the plane will have a little dark trial at some point. Usually they say thank you at the end of the trip because it's interesting and they haven't thought about it. And they're going to die one day. So remember those four key points. There's also a booklet down there if you want it, which develops these things on, on a great scale. Uh, they're not only four. Toyn be a long while ago pointed out that cultures collapse not in non-specific ways, but in specific ways. And he spent his life looking at why cultures decay. And at the end of his life, in a book he called A Historian Looks at Religion, he figured the following things. He said, the first thing that happens to a culture that's about to disappear is that it loses its moral consensus. Does that happen to us? Sure. You see, you, can only, you cannot build a multicultural society. You can only build a multicultural collection of people. It only becomes a society when it has a moral consensus. So you only have little societies within the bigger society. The bigger society is not a society. We should cease to call it that. We're just people who agree to live in Canada or the US or the Western world because it's more comfortable. And they want to bring with them all the other things they had. And if they ever became the majority, without thinking, they would try and impose it, including Dimitri. We need to talk about these things. So get that straight in your life. I've got two women now telling me how many minutes I've got left. They don't agree on how many minutes it is, but they both know I don't have a watch. So that's the problem. Once a society has lost its moral consensus, then the next thing that begins to happen is a disrespect for law. Because you know, if you change parties, the laws get changed in a way, sometimes you like them more than others. Some of them you dislike intensely. So your respect for law is undermined. And it's been, it doesn't stop there, it spreads, it's a disease. So we're becoming more and more anarchic, aren't we? Courtesies are disappearing. They're gone, largely. I remember the first time I sat, stood up to give my seat to a woman and she told me, I'm just as capable of standing as you are. That was the end of courtesy at that level. She should have said, thank you, keep it up as long as you can, but she didn't. <laughs> So that's the next one. Of course, once you start doing that, you don't feel good about yourself. We, we are made to realize that true freedom is not the freedom to do what you want, but to do what you ought. And in order to do that, you need a framework of law in the first place. No framework of law, no true freedom, only anarchy in the heart. So that's what happens next. When you don't like yourself, you start using drugs and alcohol. Because you don't like yourself when you wake up. A drunkard says, when you're drunk and you wake up, you don't like it, so you get drunk again, so that you don't feel it for a bit. You're trapped. When I tell students I didn't see my first drug addict till I was 26, they don't believe me. They don't know how old I am, of course. Um, but that's true. Now, that leads on to the next one, and that's this sense of apathy, that we can't do anything about it. Your voting records show it, don't they? I mean, Americans proposing democracy for the world, where in most elections you can't get 50% of vote, uh, it doesn't make sense. We're not involved. We're not engaged. And you're more engaged than most. Now, that leads finally to two forms of promiscuity, sexual and intellectual. The sexual one is absolutely amazing in my lifetime. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but this is one of the big revolutions of Joe back there. When I went to medical school, none of the girls in the class were sexually active because we didn't have the bill. And they were smart enough, they were not going to give their virginity away until they got one, or preferably two rings on their finger. <laughs> so there was no sexually transmitted disease in university students. Now it's over 25% in the women, most of which they don't know about. Is that correct? Yeah. That is a terrible state of affairs. For the first time a few years ago, American life expectancy dropped and it was sexually transmitted disease that was responsible. Now, intellectual promiscuity is even worse because the students don't even know when a statement is true and when it's false. 
So evidence-based mentioning is absolute nonsense because it's not evidence-based, it's authority-based. If it's published in the New England Journal, you believe it. You ought to have the right, at least unless it's published from Boston, um, uh, then you don't believe it because they should have published it somewhere else. But no, that it's not about evidence. I used to say at one stage I was a, a legitimate reviewer of about 0.501% of the literature. That was because I'd invented a technique, so I knew what it could do. I had brought it to life. I had taken it through its TV problems. It was amazing how many people made it much more precise than it could possibly be. I knew, in other words, they were cheating. I couldn't stop them. They cannot recognize a neological statement because they do not know classical logic. We ought to be teaching it. And I have to stop because otherwise three, two ladies will have uh, a problem. But I'm going to finish by reading a beautiful paragraph. This is Gilbert Mylander. And it's something else. You might want to copy this. I'll give it to you. Do it and send it to everybody. This is what he wrote. Indeed, the real bulwark of a sphere of private conscience protected from government coercion turns out, in fact, to be the church whose very existence is amongst the most important historical causes of such liberty in the West. The continued existence of a church intent on being church, intent on offering itself as an alternative community that claims our loyalty, thwarts the pretensions of political rule. In a society where there is such a church, politics can never claim citizens to the whole extent of their being. The best protection of human liberty, of a private realm beyond the proper power of government, is not any concept of public reason denuded of religious language and commitment. It is rather the church, with its distinctive way of life, determined to bear public witness to its life and to be Christ's body in the world, whose very presence announces the political rule can never be redemptive and must therefore be limited. Hence it is no paradox but simple truth to say that only a church set over against the world can be a church for the world. In setting limits to politics, the church points to God, who alone can claim our final allegiance, and it thereby reminds us that no lesser God can claim us wholly and entirely. Thank you.